So have you ever tried a head-mounted display at a trade show, stuck them on and maybe? Actually, no. Actually, this will be the first okay. time. That, that's a little bit unfortunate because this demo is much more impressive for people that have tried the state of things before this. I, you know, those of us that have, been, that have been around for a while, from the early 90s on, there was the whole VR craze about how it's going to throw you into these virtual worlds and change everything. So people have this idea in their head of what putting on a head-mounted display is like. And it really hasn't been like that vision at all. The pe people wind up being bitterly disappointed when you wind up buying some little head mount display or trying something at a trade show because they, they've had generally very small fields of view. I, your typical, like the Sony display here was actually, this came out in February and it's great. It's the best consumer level device that, that's been available. It's a big advance. This has a 45 degree horizontal field of view. Before that, a lot of them had 26 to 30 degrees, which is like toilet paper tubes. You know, you, you just are not immersed with that. But field of view is a big deal. You want to have it block out the world around you. You don't want to see like, you know, everything down below or above the screens on there. You want to be thrown into the world immersed. So field of view is a big deal. The other thing that's been really bad on VR demos is uh, the latency from time from motion to the time that the view actually changes and I, I harp about latency all the time even in regular gaming about how you want your time from button press to you know gun firing on the screen to be as short as possible you want your 60 frames per second gaming and all of that is magnified in importance in VR where you tolerate a lot when you're doing something with a thumbstick on there you tolerate less when you're doing something with a mouse and you tolerate even less when it's your head doing the moving your brain knows what the world's supposed to look like so I'm pursuing three or four different axes of improvement on here. I started building some things myself on there. I, you know, I'd go over to my rocket shop at Armadillo and, uh, and cobble things together there. I, and I wound up, I, like, I wound up using the inertial uh, integration code from my rocket at Armadillo to replace what was being done on the sensors here. Uh, I got the sensor company Hillcrest Labs to actually burn me a custom firmware that upped the, upda the, uh, the update rate from the software on there, which is great. So I've done a bunch of things through here. But then Doom 3 was this opportunity to turn this thing, stuff I was tinkering with for fun and actually make it relevant to the company's business on there. So I could do the 3D TV support. I think I did a good job on that. I'm still not the world's biggest booster of 3D TVs, especially for consoles where you have to trade off some frame rate. But then I can use this VR experience as something else that, that is cutting edge, that is worth people coming and looking at an eight-year-old game and, you know, and saying some nice things about it. So uh, I had been building, I actually have like five head mounts in different stages of uh, construction at my office. But the one that I brought uh, was actually built by uh, a guy named Palmer Lucky. It's called the Oculus Rift. And he built this in his workshop. I added my sensors and a strap to hold it on, and I built software into the game for it. Uh, but what's amazing about this is, this is a 90 degree horizontal field of view, and it's 110 degrees vertical. It cuts, off, cuts you off completely from the world. It throws you into there. And this is intended to be available at around $500 for a kit. It's not a consumer device, but for the hacker maker crowd, this is going to be amazingly cool. You know, you still have to add a motion tracker on here, and then there's no soft, Doom 3 is gonna be the only software that really natively supports this. Because the interesting thing about this is, the reason people didn't do this 20 years ago on general VR stuff is, you have a couple cheap lenses in here over a display, it gives a very warped, fish-eyed view of the world. And back then, you really couldn't do anything about that. But now, I use a pixel shader to invert the warp of that, so I reverse fish-eye the warp in the game, and then the optics pull that back out and you're left with a straight and square view of the world. So the things that you'll notice about this, it is very immersive. I'll hand you wireless headphones and a wireless game controller on here. You can literally turn all the way around until you trip on the cables with this. Wouldn't recommend it though. But. Yeah, uh, but eventually this will all be wireless or it'll be self-contained like an iPad on there and you'll be able to, to do a very different experience there. So the resolution's not very high. It's a 1280 by 800 panel back here that has each eye looking at half of it. So each eye only has 640 by 800 resolution and it's stretched over a huge area. So you can resolve pixels on it, but that's, there are so many forces driving mobile displays now. We will have 1080p displays, you know, within months and Toshiba's got a two and a half K display, which is amazing when you think about it. It's a 30 inch monitor crunched down to six inches that will totally fit in this. Uh, the other aspect of it is this tracks orientation on this. Uh, it does not track position. 
So if you sway your body side to side, it does not pick that up and the world won't respond. And that's a good way to make yourself feel a little sick in this. Like, look at the floor and sway side to side and the world's not doing what it's supposed to. I was going to ask, is there, is there any buckets in the room here? Just no, no one's lost it yet. <laughs> you know, one person started getting a little bit <laughs> like that. I'm like, don't throw up on my head mount. We've got more people to show this to. But in general, this is people have said that the, the gameplay experience on here is intuitive. You should pick it up pretty fast. One of the things I had to change in the game is if you hack in head mount display support normally, you're stuck with aiming with your neck. You know, you're moving around like this. So you still need to be able to turn with the joypad so you don't have to turn circles and tie yourself up in the cables, but you can aim independently. So the right thumbstick lets you pitch the weapon up or down. And what's interesting is I find you kind of do the natural behavior on there where when there's no monsters around, you pitch it down to get it out of your view and you pitch it back up when you're in combat. And it's an extra little interesting level there. And so you could you can sort of rough it in with the joy pad and then you can finish and keep your bead on them with your head mount on there. So um, it is possible that because the positioning is a very important 3D cue, in most games are a disembodied eyeball. You're just an eyeball rotating in space. Uh, to give a little bit of motion to this, I have a head neck model, so it pivots like this. So there's a small amount of motion with that. So if you're doing a certain motion, it's it feels correct. But most motions that you're moving around, it's not going to be exactly correct on there. So it's not a world locked in place. This display is a... Uh, you know, it's not a high-end embedded LCD. Uh, something like uh, an iPhone Retina display switches a lot faster and has denser pixels on here. So there's a little bit of ghosting. It takes a little bit of switching time. It's. Uh, I had another display that I had hoped to bring to show both that was 120 frame per second OLED that was the world's fastest updating head mount, but uh, I had to send back the boards for that. So those are the flaws of this, where it's uh, the resolution's low, it doesn't track position, it's a little bit slow on the ghosting, but it's still the best VR demo that you'll see him. I like it. Let's let's try this. Oh my god! Is it best to sit or stand with this? I think the experience is more immersive standing, but some people have expressed some worry about falling over. I'll catch you if you fall back here. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm just here. Promise me yeah. that. Man. Promise me that. tell you it must have eaten a fireball in the face you're like that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> and so there that's one of the axes of improvement and in fact the uh let's go ahead and sit back down all right yeah yeah Woo. All right, so one of the axes of improvement from there is that only had attitude sensing on there. So when you were trying to bob and weave around the fireballs on that, it wasn't working <laughs> on that. It's so immersive that you just feel the need to do that anyway. But we can do that. That's the exciting thing where there are a couple different sensor technologies that can give us what we want there. And I've spent a while working with the Sixth Sense Razor Hydra, which is kind of a, you know, lightsaber remote sort of thing on there. And I've taken some of those apart and you tried to use those because they give positional information there. and they're very precise in that they'll give millimeter level accuracy on there, but they're not accurate where it's, if it works fine over here, it's gonna be different over there. And you don't care if your lightsaber is 15 degrees off, but you care a lot if your head is 15 degrees off. But still, I had some demos set up with that where if you're looking the right direction and I calibrated it right, 
you could lean over and look at something. You could even get down on your knees and put your hand on the virtual floor and look down at pebbles on the ground, which was really amazing. That is a whole nother level. I mean, this is cool, but there are several dimensions of extra coolness that can be added onto this with the technology that's available today. I was going to say, I mean, how, how much more tinkering do you want to do? Do you, do you have a set goal to go, right, at this point, I'm going to have to draw a line here? Because essentially, you could be infinitely just tinkering, tinkering, tinkering. Yeah, so technically, I'm off the project right now. You know, I'm back onto the big projects that's going to take a while longer on there. But the hope is that uh, Palmer can get these kits together. He's going to run a Kickstarter probably starting uh, later this month to try and get the first batch together. And initially, he was looking at probably 100 units. I suspect he's going to have a lot more demand than that on this because this is one of those fundamentally cool things. It doesn't matter if you give us 100 times more GPU power when we start rendering movies. They're still on a screen. and. You get the sense that you are sharing this dark, clammy world with those monsters in there. And when they're coming around the corner, it affects you in a way that looking at even your big screen TV does not do. Now, you're obviously saying that it's cost prohibitive for, for most consumers, that it's high end. But would you like to see the idea of something like that get to the point where it's, it's acceptable to buy for the common guy? So I think where this will wind up consumer friendly is eventually you'll see this driven by mobile phone style hardware. So there's no wires and it's self-contained. And they are mobile phones already have most of the, the gear needed for that. They've got the display, they've got cameras, accelerometers, gyros. The firmware is not set up right for doing all of this, but you know, there's actually a Hasbro toy that you can stick your iPhone in that gives kind of a Viewmaster binocular view. It's, it's done bad in all sorts of ways along the chain, but that type of thing could in theory be something that almost works there. But I wouldn't be surprised if somebody like Apple or Google, I mean, Google's pushing the augmented reality on there, which I do believe has more broad potential on there. That's the type of thing where you could imagine everybody that has a smartphone now has augmented reality glasses in five years or something. And that could happen faster than we're expecting on there. But it is worth understanding that the reality of what they've got is not what their vision pitch is. There's, there's a broad gulf there. But my heart's still mostly with the immersive VR. Really, that's all what we... That's what we've always been doing with first-person shooters, is trying to immerse you into a world, and this takes it to the logical step, and it is the vision that people had back when we were starting in the 90s here, that you can actually make it happen now. So what I think is going to happen is, we'll get a bunch of these kits out, uh, I hope to be able to contribute some software as well as the, the Doom 3 BFG Edition stuff on there, so there's there's at least one piece of consume commercial software that will give a good experience with this, but it'll go out to the people that make things in their workshop, and we'll get 100 people doing different takes on them. Most of them will build the stock as, it's, as the instructions say, but there's going to be a good chunk of the people that say, no, I want to adjust my focusing, I want to adjust the interocular space, I want to make a different, contain, uh, a different head mount on there, I want to attach it differently, and that's the type of genetic experimentation that's going to be really important for this, because, you know, like, so Sony built this and it's a good device in many ways but it's got a lot of flaws and if they had had a hundred people making different takes on it before that they would have wound up with a better project and we had somebody from Sony in here yesterday looking at this stuff and I uh, there was their reaction yeah they're gonna want to pick up a couple kits for their R&D group uh, so I think that It'll be great. We'll have a year of experimentation with this of people doing different things. And then it is compelling enough that I think that one of the majors will step in and want to kind of productize it and do the whole software ecosystem and have broad support and all the things that's necessary to make it something that consumers would be happy with.